So we know that since the ACA passed, the Republican Party has been fairly unified and consistent in trying to destroy it. And since Donald Trump got into office, he has been a part of that effort. But surely now, during a time of an international pandemic that has taken so many lives, they wouldn't still be trying to shred the ACA, would they? Unfortunately, they are. And joining us now to break it down is Professor and Director of the Center for Medicine, Health and Society at Vanderbilt University, as well as the author of Dying of Whiteness, Jonathan Metzl. Welcome back to the Damage Report. Great to be back, thanks. It's good to have you here, wish it could be for more positive news, but the show is what it is. So you had an article recently in US News and World Report talking about the ongoing assault against the ACA. Um, even now, amidst all of what's going on in terms of public health, can you can you break down um, what form it's coming in? Well, there are two, I think a couple of things that are important about that. Number one is that there was a there was a real moment in this pandemic in March when the pandemic first hit, and we first saw how devastating the coronavirus was, not just from a medical and health perspective, but also from a financial perspective. People weren't going to be able to go to work. And that was the moment where I think a rational government would have utilized the only national healthcare system it has at its disposal to expand network coverage for everyone. And so that that kind of late March period, period number one, um, should have been the time that the Trump administration pushed to expand, um, to kind of do the Medicaid expansion everywhere and basically bring everybody in the country under the umbrella of the Affordable Care Act. And it, and it didn't do that. And that was really for me one of the many catastrophic turning points because all of a sudden people who didn't have their jobs, didn't have access to health care. Mm-hmm. And states like red states where Trump supporters are now suffering and other people are suffering, um, didn't have what you need in a pandemic, which is if you feel like you're getting sick, you want access to a doctor. You don't want to worry that if you go to a doctor, you're going to suffer a medical bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is people stay away from the doctor and then they get sicker and sicker and they spread the coronavirus more. And so that 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 first moment was the moment that that really was a True, it's going to, historians are going to look back on that moment and say that that was one of the turning points was not supporting the Affordable Care Act. And the second was a few weeks later when not only did they not support the Affordable Care Act, they they wrote a almost 100 page document in support of a case that's going to go before the Supreme Court that basically says we want to destroy the entire act. And basically they said that the entire act must fall. And to do that at this moment, um, it, it doesn't get, gather some of the headlines of other things, but I think at, at an aggregate level, it's it's really one of the more deadly, fatal, catastrophic, mm. and also financially catastrophic um, things that the, that the administration could have done. And and just to be clear, if they were, to, let's say that he could snap his fingers and the ACA is gone, um, how many people? In the end, you know, regardless of how long that might take, would end up losing their insurance as a result of that change of going back to the system pre-ACA. Well, that that's a really important important question. And, and to be clear, he couldn't have snapped his fingers and and um, and and used and said everybody do the ACA, but he could have pressured Republican red states to. Ex- to expand, which is really mm-hmm. what needed to happen. And we gave them the okay to not do that and said, we're still gonna go after the ACA. Um, that was really the action that, that really needed to be taken. Um, before the ACA, you know, 20, 30, 40 million people didn't have health insurance in this country. Um, and, and so we'd be going back to those numbers, if not more, because so many people are, are out of work. So we're talking about tens of millions of people losing their health insurance. Um, and there's also a very important race story here because among the other things that the ACA did um, is that it was very effective at getting health care coverage for black and brown populations, um, particularly in blue states. And so before the ACA, for example, 33% of Latinx people in this country didn't have health insurance. Result of the ACA, mostly in, in blue states, um, that number went down to about 17 um, percent. Mm-hmm. African American people, 25 percent on insurance, and that went down down to 10 percent in some areas. So, very effective at getting health insurance, not health care coverage, but health insurance um, mm-hmm. for Black and Brown people. And those gains would be dramatically reversed. What we would also see is a lot of African American and Latinx people, particularly in places that are under attack right now by Trump, um, New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, blue cities, blue states, losing their insurance. And so there's a huge over inter- intersection. That's what I was writing the piece about um, between 
the protests about structural racism that are mm. happening now and these truly structurally racist effects of what would it mean to, to end the ACA right now. You, you mentioned a couple of times right there that generally these gains um, in breaking in, in I guess um, narrowing the racial inequity in, in health insurance coverage was generally in the blue states. I have a couple of suspicions, but why is it that it was in the blue states and not so much in the red? Well, voters in those states voted in governors usually or, or legislators um, who did a, a number of things. They accepted the Medicaid expansion, so they voted in the expansion um, of, of Medicaid under the ACA as opposed to blocking it, which is what we did in Tennessee and other red states. So that's number one. You're basically <clears throat> giving away free health insurance coverage for your people when you do that. Um, and then number two is that you create competitive insurance marketplaces. And what those did is they created competition among providers which lowered costs for people. And so in, in the book I wrote, Dying of Whiteness, I showed how states that did that, even though there were great disparities about healthcare access and things like that. But people in states that expanded and also um, created these marketplaces, they, they, it was much easier for them to go to the doctor, their, their rural hospitals didn't close, they paid less for prescription medications, mm -hmm. there were fewer medical bankruptcies. And ultimately what you saw was people lived longer because they were going into the doctor for preventative care. And places that didn't do that, like Tennessee, um, saw falling life expectancy, not just in minoritized people, but also in lower income white people who you would think would, would support it. So the question is, well, why didn't they, why didn't they support it? Yeah, exactly. And you know, I, I know that we, we talked about your book, I believe the last time you were on. So as you point out, there's obviously this, this massive racial component to um, who has the coverage as well as who is suffering the most during the current pandemic. But also many of those poor whites, probably reliable Republican voters, they have also been suffering due to the, the, the public health and insurance and you know, all of that uh, policies that are being pushed by the representatives and the governors that they've been enthusiastically supporting. Right, and, and and it's a conscious act. I'm not trying to get them off the hook, but in the book, in the book, I show that they're suffering more in a lot of cases because a lot of the states that don't do it are the demographic majority is is white people. And and so what what I found is if you just aggregate it out, um, white men saw the the largest drop in in life expectancy by these policies. And and mm -hmm. so, um, you know, I it it's just at this moment. I mean, I understand because you know when I wrote the book, I asked people why aren't you supporting your own health care, and they said um, uh, some people were terrified and mortified, like many people are, and other people said. These big government programs only benefit welfare queens and all these racial stereotypes. And so there is a racial politics why they didn't support it. Um, yeah. But I think right now, man, you know, like this is the time. And also, not just now, but wait till there's a vaccine, wait till there's a medication treatment or something like that. Like you're going to want health insurance. And, and Trump keeps saying we're going to destroy it and we're going to replace it with something better. And that the plan for that something better is. Um, well, I can't say that word on the air, but there's <laughs> there's there there's no plan for anything better. It's just destroying the only national health care plan they have right now, um, and 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 replacing it with nothing. You know, I, I'm glad that you pointed that out because I, you know I want to my, my last question. I want to sort of look forward. Um, they you know there there has been legislation early on in the Trump administration. They had the, you know the the big bill that famously John McCain um, you know put the kibosh on at the last second. <laughs> Um, exactly, the thumbs yeah. down. There hasn't been, and he keeps saying, I'm going to have a plan for you, it's gonna be great. He did that again within the last couple of weeks and it never really seems to come. It seems like rather than replacing it with new legislation, the strategy really is we're going to get it to the Supreme Court and we're gonna find a way to continue to chip away at it or take down the entire thing. And yeah. their, their record with that over the past five years or so has been obviously mixed. Is it possible? What, what do you think about the future of those efforts? Were Donald Trump to get reelected, potentially have one or two more justices on the Supreme Court? How much does that change the calculus of the ACA being able to survive that period? It, it wouldn't survive. John Roberts, uh, you know, Justice Roberts is the is the uh, sorry is the um, it, it is who saved the the, the, the Affordable Care Act, uh, basically saying that it's constitutional to have people buy into a national health insurance plan that. Every other country has pretty much, um, but 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 if that balance shifted, that that wouldn't be happening. And so yeah. we can we can argue about slogans and Medicare for all and this and that and all that kind of stuff. If Trump wins the election, that none of that's going to happen. And I, people who know who read my 
have read my stuff know that I feel like the Affordable Care Act actually was a good starter drug um, to get us to some kind of national health care plan. So um, I don't think that people who support Medicare for all should be rooting for the Affordable Care Act to, to end either because um, just look what it takes to get an, something like this through Congress and Senate and signed. Um, it, 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 it probably wouldn't happen again. And so in a way, building off of that is, is the best strategy. And if, and if Trump gets his way, um, it's, it's, a, it's a catastrophe, honestly. Uh, looks like it's shaping up in that direction. Uh, uh, Jonathan's book is uh, Dying of Whiteness, which is available. And if you want more information uh, about Trump's battle against uh, the ACA, his article, Trump's Pandemic Attack on the Affordable Care Act is available at US News and World Report. Jonathan Metzl, as always, thank you. Thanks so much. Check out the Damage Report podcast each day, wherever you get your podcasts, whether Pocket Casts or Stitcher or iTunes. You can join me as I give you the news and stories you want with a range of co-hosts and interview guests jumping in on the fun each day. Again, that's the Damage Report, wherever you get your podcasts. And if you get them at iTunes, don't forget to rate and review. Sometimes I'll read them live on the show.